Okay, we're live. Thanks for showing up in person. Thanks for showing up online. So this is a, uh, a version of the Divinely Designed series, specifically about the immune system. Somebody specifically asked if I could do something related to cold and flu season. So we're going to talk about boosting your immune system tonight, things that can actually do the opposite as well. So things to look out for. So we start with, remember health, the definition of health really had nothing to do with symptoms. It's a state of mental, physical, spiritual well-being or normal function. So we're going to talk about function tonight. Okay, in Webster's Dictionary, remember, it's a state of normal function of all the parts of the body, all the systems in the body. So that normal function, remember, there's something that, that's going to happen here to take us off that course of normal function or what we call ease in chiropractic philosophy. Remember, ease is that state where the buildup in your body is equal to the breakdown. Okay, that's ease. So sometimes we can have things that will cause us to go off of that, that line of ease and into dis-ease, to go away from ease. And if it's in that state long enough, eventually we end up with symptoms and the effects, you know, of a disease, an actual disease. So dis-ease is just that state where the breakdown in your body exceeds the build up. Okay. So things are going downhill. And that's, you know, from, from the very first, it, it can be. So we know because this is a chiropractic talk, we're going to talk about the causes of that, some of the causes. We can talk about subluxation, but we're also going to talk about certain deficiencies. And we hit on this a little bit last week. So um, before we get into that, I want to talk about the germ theory of disease. So Koch's postulates, this is actually credited as the, the germ theory of disease. So the germ theory is just that germs cause disease, right? So in Koch's postulates, when you, when you go back to your high school uh, biology book, they'll talk about you're supposed to be able to take that, that micro, take, take a sick individual, okay, that rat, and take the uh, blood or sputum or whatever from that sick individual and isolate a causal agent, a bacteria, a virus, pathogen of some sort, okay, a bug. Then you're supposed to be able to isolate it and inject it into, they've recently said, a healthy individual, but Koch's postulates originally said a susceptible individual, okay? There's a difference, right? So we're going to talk about what is susceptible versus what is healthy. A healthy individual, if we in inject it into that healthy individual, are, gain, are they going to react the same way as a susceptible individual? Because Koch's postulates say if you inject it into the susceptible individual, it should produce the same result, okay? So if you got a dead rat up here, you found what killed it, you inject it into a susceptible individual, you're probably going to have a dead rat, all right? But remember there's a difference between function and dysfunction, being, being sick and then your body having maybe a symptom that is what, what we would consider just a normal function that might not be pleasant, right? So if we got a runny nose, is there a purpose for that? Does that have a function in your body? So if we get exposed to something in the air, like a virus, bacteria, whatever, dust, in a normal healthy individual, there's a mechanism that will identify that's not supposed to be in my nose, and then you're going to produce more mucus because that's one of the first lines of defense. Okay, the skin is the first line of defense, the hair up there, but then the mucus, that's one of the, the first lines of defense for making sure something doesn't get into your body. Okay, so we talk about this stuff like the vomiting. Again, if you, go, you eat something that's not supposed to be in your stomach, you're supposed to, in a healthy individual, be able to identify that's a poison. It's not supposed to be there. And then you're supposed to have a mechanism for dealing with that vomiting. Now, it's not pleasant. Neither is this, okay, out the other end. But either way, if we don't get rid of it, the point is you're going to end up in the hospital getting your stomach pumped or something like that. And just about everything on this list, including that cough, for example, similar uh, mechanism. It's your, your body's identifying there's something in your lungs in that instance not supposed to be there. We have a mechanism for getting rid of it, okay? As long as everything is communicating, 
the way it's supposed to, and your brain finds out that there's something in your lungs that's not supposed to be there, right? So the one on this list that we always kind of hit on because we've got studies to look at, that fever, is, is a fever a good thing? Does a fever have a purpose in your body? We always talk about this, this fever study that was done at Harvard. This is over 20 years ago now, but they had 200 volunteers over a two year period of time. When you came in, you filled out their intake form. If one of the things that you had listed was, I had a fever, you're asked, you want to participate in our study. If you say yes, you're going into one of two groups. You're either in the placebo group or you're in the Tylenol group. Okay. Now, Tylenol, but at this point, we already knew that Tylenol reduces a fever. That's not what they were testing. They were testing to see, is there going to be a difference in outcome between a placebo group in terms of their recovery versus a Tylenol group? So does a fever, again, we're not saying let a fever run up to 100, we're not saying let a fever run up to 120 degrees and do nothing about it. Because if you do have a real high spiking fever that shoots up real high real fast, that could be a medical emergency. We got a place for you to go for that called the emergency room, right? But what percent of your fevers are going to be that? That's what they were looking at, okay? So does a fever have a purpose in your body? Everybody says, yeah. What is that fever's purpose? What is it supposed to do? Burn off that bug because most of those bugs, whether it's a bacteria or a virus, they're very temperature specific. So you raise that temperature up a degree or two, it's going to kill them because they have that, that narrow range that they'll actually survive. Most of them are kind of wimpy when it comes to that, okay? So think normal function. And a normally functioning individual, they get exposed to that bug that's out there. What are they going to do? They're going to identify that that bug is in them that's not supposed to be there. And one of the first things that they do is going to be to spike that fever, right, to burn off that bug. That's like the second line of defense. If it gets beyond the, the mucus and the membranes, into the second line of defense, then that fever will spike to burn off that bug, okay? But now, let's say we give that healthy individual who's spiking that normal fever a Tylenol. Did we just increase their function or did we decrease their function? We decrease their function. We actually bring that fever down to a nice comfy level for who? For them, but also that bug. So after 24 hours, that bug is now reproducing and there's more. Usually after four hours, the body tries to spike that fever back up, but they gave them another Tylenol every four hours to keep that fever at a low level. Basically, take that fever out of the equation for recovery, okay? And what they found, whoops, back up, sorry. What they found was 90% of your fevers will break within uh, 24 hours and 99 broke within 48 hours. So the, the fever was successful within 48 hours, 99% of the time. Okay, if we did nothing and just let that body go up to 102 degrees or whatever it is, it would be successful 99% of the time, as opposed to if we intervene with it. What they found was the placebo group got better three to four days sooner than the Tylenol group because of that whole nonsense, right? And three to four days is the amount of time that it takes the, the body to mount a cell-mediated response, meaning to generate those immune cells and get them to the site of that infection, okay, and then kill the bug and clean it up. Three to four days sooner. So that was the point here. It, it was just saying um, if we interfere with that, that normal function, okay, assuming that that fever 99% of the time is a normal function, what, what's the end result? The end result is it takes that fever out of the equation then we got to go to the, the, the next line of defense, which are those immune cells. And we hit on something last week that I thought I would bring up because there was actually research on iron deficiency and fevers, okay, because iron is one of the cofactors in your body generating a fever. So people who are deficient, and we're going to talk about deficiencies, that's one of the causes, right? So people who are deficient won't generate that fever high enough or for long enough to kill off that bug and then the fever breaks and it, and it comes back down to a nice healthy level. So deficiency is one of those potential causes of that dis-ease, right? So the Harvard study on rhinovirus, which is the common cold virus, um, you know, upper respiratory we're talking. So remember, the germ theory says that now as it's quoted, 
that we should be able to take that virus, okay, from this sick individual, isolate that virus, and inject it into a healthy person and get the same result. Well, what they found in this study was only 12% of the people where they actually isolated that virus and implanted it directly in their, their nasal mucosa, the mucous membranes of, of their nose and throat, you would expect, oh, well, 100% of them are going to get sick, right? Only 12%. Nope. This, this, is, this is virus that had been regenerated and, and grown in a Petri dish, okay? But it's because of the, uh, the key word, susceptible, okay? If this person gets exposed to that virus, and we've all been there where, you know, you can be on a bus full of sick people and you're just fine. You know, everybody in your house has it, but you're just fine. You're not susceptible, okay? And then you've, you've all been there where it's winter, you're... You're beaten down, you're bogged down at work, you're stressed, and all this other crap is going on in your life, and somebody sneezes a half a block away, and you get it, right? So <laughs> the point is, susceptible is that key word. So what type of things can make us susceptible? That's what we're going to go over here. So what's the immune system? Well, we know it's a complex uh, network of cells and proteins that defends your body, okay? So um, it keeps a record. We, we've got the uh, different parts of the immune system here. Certain cells that will keep record to form antibodies later. This is an antibody, okay? So we've got the, the T cells and the B cells that, that have uh, memory, make antibodies when they come in contact. But when we're looking at the immune system as a whole, we're looking at things like the membranes there. Even cell membranes, mucous membranes are a part of that immune system. All right. And then when when a bug comes in and it, and it locks onto one of these receptors on that mucous membrane, there are inflammatory mediators, inflammatory, raise that temperature. OK, so the signal comes from Im impact or contact at an early stage, that mucous membrane. So the mucous membrane will secrete mucus. That's one of these inflammatory responses okay those there are certain cells that are responsible for that and we don't have to go into like every you know stinking cell but there are different cells that are eosinophils for example that are uh responsible for releasing these chemicals and, it, and it's really complex but basically you got these membrane cells with receptors that triggers the early warning systems like the mucus secretion and the fever generation okay and then you've got the second line of defense. Like I said, that takes three to four days somewhere in here where your body's going to generate these white blood cells and then get them to the site and kill that thing. Okay. And then you've got the, the latter stages of the acquired immunity where these cells that ate up that bug to begin with go and lock onto one of these cells that have memory. Okay. And they give that antigen that's been they break that virus down into parts, all right? And then they give parts to these cells to make antibodies to each of those different parts. So you, you might not, like the spike protein, for example, of, of the, the spike protein of the um, COVID virus, right? That's, that's just one part of that, that virus. But your body's immune system here, these cells, when it comes in contact with that virus, It'll kill it, it'll break it down into parts, and it might pass that spike protein off to one of these cells to make antibodies to it, okay? It'll make antibodies to other proteins within that too. So it's not just like it has to have the whole bug to, to make you sick. Some, sometimes even just that one protein can, can you know, be detrimental to your health. So your body has defenses against all those proteins that it's going to, you know, these cells are going to break down and give to these cells, okay? So we've got the innate immune system, okay? That's like first lines of defense, and then the acquired immune system that's gonna remember those things for years, all right? So the next time you get exposed to it, boom, these cells right away release those antibodies so that you're gonna be able to kill it, you know, quick, so that an infection doesn't rise in your system. So 
We've got uh, the innate immune system, you know, real, real quick, and then the adaptive immune system that's based on these T cells, the antigens, the uh, memory, okay? So what all makes up the immune, the immune system? We've got those mucous membranes, like your ears, eyes, nose, through throat, they have mucous membranes that secrete mucus. Then, of course, that mucus runs usually down the back of the throat into the lymph vessels there. Uh, tonsils are also a lymph type uh, vessel or, or uh, gland, I'm sorry. Those lymph nodes, again, are glands, part of that immune system. Uh, the skin, most of us don't really think of the skin as being part of the immune system, but again, it's a barrier, okay? That's that first line of defense. The spleen, the spleen is in part uh, responsible for helping us raise that temperature, okay? And the thymus, that's one of those uh, glands that actually makes white blood cells, okay? The majority of those white blood cells are made in the thymus. So um, as far as deficiencies go, we're looking at things that might actually affect thymus production of those immune cells or thymus communication with the other parts of the body, okay? So what is susceptible? When uh, Claude Bernard and Louis Pasteur were, were having this debate back and forth, Louis Pasteur said um, that it's the seed, not the soil, right? It's the bug that makes people sick, not the fact that they're susceptible. It's, you, know, you understand that analogy, seed and soil. Whereas Claude Bernard, he said, no, you can inject that, that bug into that healthy individual and it, it, it doesn't make them sick. It's the soil, okay? So they argued back and forth about this. And then uh, in, I think it was like in the 1860s, Farr's Law. If you guys heard of Farr's Law, that's where we got the bell curve. And basically every respiratory virus and most of the other viruses that we've ever seen uh, come, come in contact with people follow this bell curve where you've got the majority of the people in the middle here, you know, actually probably from here over to here, roughly about 80% of the population, they get exposed to this virus. They're either going to, you know, within 24 hours, burn it off and just have mild symptoms like a, a fever, maybe a cough or whatever. And then you've got this 2.1% this here, which they're going to be ill. They're the ones that are going to be susceptible and they're probably going to end up, you know, going to the ER or, or going to the doctor to get some antibiotics or whatever it is. And then you've got this 0.1%. Usually those are the ones who, you know, if, if you go through the, you know, the old folks home or something like that, they're all susceptible or not all of them, but I mean, that 0.1%, that's usually where you're going to see those, those 0.1% or they're, they're very ill to begin with. Usually they're not, they're not healthy. So they're highly susceptible to that bug going through and just wiping them out. Okay. So it's that 0.1% is like fatality rate for like flu, COVID, you know, most of those respiratory bugs. So what they found when uh, they were having this debate is that there's basically three types of things that will cause susceptibility. So causes of susceptibility, nutritional deficiencies, I think more and more we're starting to understand that. We just kind of hit on that by accident. And then I go look and I'm like, yeah, there's tons of studies on this. So the things that really help fuel your immune system or your immune response, let's say, iron is a big one. If you're, if you're a lady and you're menstruating, you're iron deficient, you might deal with that low-grade fever where you're not going to spike it high enough to burn off that bug in 24 hours away. You'll deal with that kind of thing pretty frequently. And now that I started paying attention to it, yeah, like a lot of ladies said, yet, oh, yeah, I have that issue. So that's a big one. But it's not just iron. Again, nutritional deficiencies. I would put like vitamin D in there as well because when the sun isn't, when you're in the northern hemisphere and the sun isn't out, you know, for all but, you know, an hour a day or something like that, we don't get a lot of vitamin D, you know, and we're going to have to supplement it. We're going to have to get it nutritionally. So I would put that as, as a nutritional deficiency potentially. 
Uh, vitamin C, we all know about that. That's a big one for our immune system. Vitamin E, uh, zinc. Um, what's the other ones? <laughs> I was just looking at. But all of those things are potential deficiencies if we're not getting them in our diet. And it's highly likely that even if we're trying to do our best to eat organic and, and get all those veggies and fruits, that we might be deficient just because of the soil erosion and, you know, those, those veggies don't have the nutrient level that they did, you know, 50 years ago. So that's why we supplement. It's not going to replace, but, you know, if, if you're only getting 50% of the vitamin C that you used to in an orange, for example, it's a good idea to supplement. So supplements, vitamin supplements are how we battle nutritional deficiencies. Okay. It's not just diet because a lot of times, that might not be enough just to get you over that deficiency hump. So the other deficiencies are functional and subluxation that would fall into that category. Okay. Because the immune system, like every other system in the body is, is either directly or indirectly controlled by the nervous system. And there are actual cells. There, there are actual nerve fibers that go down and it, pretend my arm is a blood vessel. It's carrying all those cells. And they just bounce through there, you know, from one side of the, the tube to the other. And there are nerves, like my finger here, that hook up to those blood vessels along the way. And those white blood cells will bounce up and they'll hook up to that nerve and they'll get a message. And then they'll carry on, okay? So we didn't know about that until like 20 years ago, these cells that that would actually give information from the brain or from the nervous system directly to immune cells, individual cells to tell them, we need you guys down here, you know, in the foot where we just stepped on a nail or whatever. And then those cells make their way down there. So the, the nervous system, again, is, is proving to be like the premier system that it needs to be communicating with all those parts and all those cells. Otherwise, we're not going to function that immune system isn't going to function at its optimal too. So what type of things cause those subluxations? Again, that subluxation is that misalignment in the spine that puts pressure on that nerve that chokes off that information going to those cells, okay? So we know physical stress, you know, you get, you, you jump up in a truck and smash your head on something. That's a potential, you know, for a physical stress causing a subluxation in your neck, which it did. Emotional stress, those are cumulative stresses over time that, you know, your body holds on to that stress and, and, and eventually you pull something out of alignment, okay? That's more of a repetitious type stress. Cumulative chemical stresses, all right? So um, certain poisons, certain chlorine at high levels, all those things tend to be cumulative, okay? And they poison different organs or glands. Like we know now that chlorine in, in, you know, cumulative amounts over years is, is toxic to the thyroid. And that might be why we see so many thyroid issues now that we never saw before because our water supply is just highly chlorinated. Okay. So to, to avoid these type of deficiencies, we would say, okay, get checked by a chiropractor. We're looking at those physical stresses and, and, you know, the uh, effects of the emotional stresses. But also we would say, look, look, to, uh, you know, good sources of, of water and, again, some supplements that you can use to kind of help detox those things, okay? So detoxes are good for undoing these type of deficiencies as well. Trauma, you know, in general, can cause functional deficiencies. Uh, the other one is genetic, and that accounts for less than 1% of the deficiencies. So we're, we're not going to talk about that because everybody's sitting in here right now, we're not in that that less than 1%, okay? So, we don't have drug deficiencies, right? Like, if you have a, a fever, it's not because your body is deficient in Tylenol, right? Um, it might be because we're deficient in iron, all right? So, micronutrients, study after study, in small print about all the deficiencies that we talked about, and and, the reason that I broke these down is because, again, um, the, in, in 20 vegetables, the average calcium content had declined 19%. Uh, iron had declined 22%. So 
as a lady, again, if, if you have a tendency to, to, to bleed heavy or something like that, where you're going to be deficient, deficient for a while in that iron, we can't just eat those, you know, green veggies and whatnot like we used to be able to and, and get back to that deficient or, uh, sufficiency, right? So sometimes it's going to take a supplement and that's not all bad because we have some good ones and, and they're coming out with better ones every day. So, uh, neuroimmunology, again, it's, there's now, this was actually a textbook in chiropractic college when, when I went through, which is like 20, four years ago now, but um, it was it was a fairly new field of study. I mean, they had textbooks, but now it's like very common. That's one of the main subjects that kids are going to learn going through chiropractic college. And there's a whole separate field in, in medicine on neuroimmunology. So how the nervous system actually affects the, uh, the immune system. And then um, this is actually... A, a artist's rendition of those cells attaching to these fibers within the blood vessels to get that message to go fight a you know infection in the foot somewhere. So on the whole, we're looking at potential deficiencies, okay, that are going to affect our immune system and how we battle that. We we know that we can just do better with our with our nervous system. That's a chiropractor's job. But as far as nutrition goes, we're probably going to have to look at maybe doing some detoxes to get rid of some of the heavier stuff that's in our water or in our food. We're probably going to have to look at supplementing with, you know, we like some whole food type uh, supplements where they, where they actually get the stuff from a food source. It's not like a synthetic version of a vitamin or, or you know, mineral. It's, it's actually from a food source that's just been kind of concentrated so that you can get 100% of your daily allowance by, by taking it. So um, there's a bunch of good ones, and I can give people references for those. They can check them out. I don't necessarily recommend any specific ones. I've, I can tell you what, what we've taken and what I like, but um, I, don't, I don't sell them or don't you know, necessarily push them on anybody. But that's all, other than, you know, we talked about the subluxation. <laughs> Sorry. I just assumed you guys knew about subluxation because you sat through all the subluxation talks. But remember that subluxation actually reduces that message being sent from the brain out to that cell by 60% right off the top. So those cells are getting about 40% of the messages being sent from the brain saying, hey, we got a puncture wound in the foot. Get some cells there to deal with that. So Masha and Dasha, this was the last study. Okay, so... Um, it was, it was kind of big news in, in chiropractic college, the studies that they did on Masha and Dasha. And uh, you can look these two up. Born 1950 in, in Soviet Russia, they were, their mom was told that they died at birth, and they were taken and put in a state hospital and then studied. So Siamese twins, what they, they shared organs and blood, like circulatory, okay, their, their, their blood is mixed from, from side to side. So they're, sh they're sharing some organs and they're sharing blood, but they have separate nervous systems. So separate spines. Okay. And what they found was, uh, Masha, the one who's the most crooked. Okay. Had a severe curvature of the spine and Dasha did not. Masha was often ill. Dasha mostly healthy. Masha developed measles, Dasha didn't, okay? Masha had all the spots, had a fever, had the running out, had all the symptoms, but her sister, twin, you know, Siamese adjoined, conjoined sister, didn't have any of those spots, any of the symptoms or the fever or any of that stuff. They shared blood. <laughs> how, how crazy. Uh, Masha got influenza. Again, all the symptoms, Dasha didn't. So... It was just uh, unheard of, it, it, you know, un, unfathomable for most people in even chiropractic, where, where I came from, like a medical background, I grew up in that world, to think that, okay, these two can share blood, right, but one can get sick and the other can't. 
comes down to that susceptibility. In this case, it was that subluxation. It was the curvature of her spine and the interference that created, you know, her, her brain wasn't communicating with those blood cells the way her sisters were. They're looking at the same blood cells, but her sister's uh, nervous system is communicating with those blood cells, whereas Masha's wasn't, okay? So just one more reason to get checked. And uh, the last thing, this, this actually was the reason that chiropractic got licensed in Minnesota and most of the upper Midwest was the uh, Spanish flu epidemic of 1918. There was a chiropractic uh, hospital in Davenport, Iowa at the time. And what they did was they, they looked at the uh, case fatality rate of... Uh, these people who were treated with, with chiropractic only versus people that were treated with the, the current medical treatment at the time, okay? What they found was in, in Iowa, out of 4,735 cases of influ influenza, they had only six deaths, which was one out of every 789, okay? Versus in, in Iowa, the same state, they had 93,000 cases that were treated medically and 6,000 deaths, which is one out of every 15 people died. So 0.13%, which, which is where it should be, it should be around that 0.1% versus 6.7% with the medical treatment. So they actually licensed chiropractic in most of the upper Midwest states to help fight influenza, to adjust people. Had nothing to do with neck pain, back pain, headaches back then. It was about their immune system. So I thought that was really a cool study. That's actually taught in, in chiropractic college, um, chiropractic history. So thanks again for coming. Don't forget to eat right, drink right, breathe right, move right, move right. If you haven't been checked by a chiropractor, get checked by a chiropractor. Have a great evening. Thanks for coming.